Hello everyone, my name is Rodrigo Soares and welcome to our webinar on semi-supervised classification with cluster regularization. Our algorithm can be applied to big data and as you know big data is quite challenging. Um, let's imagine that um, you want to learn what's being what's being said about your enterprise or your company or anything like that through social media messages. Um, let's say the the users they will post they will post um, opinions about your product about anything that your enterprise or institution produce. So it's quite challenging to learn from all that data and imagine that um, in order to classify that data um, not all the users will tag that uh, those messages with some sort of uh, tag that uh, that correspond to your company or a specific subject so some of those messages will be tagged will, will have some category um, associated to it and um, plenty of other messages that are actually about a specific subject a specific product of yours or or about your enterprise or anything useful and they will have this tag so how can you learn it would be really useful if you could learn from both tagged and untagged messages. And the same can be said about uh, the amount of images that are produced every day through cameras, smartphones and etc. And some of, the, some of those images can be tagged, some others uh, may not be tagged. So it, it would be a good idea if you could improve your if we could improve the the learning of of some algorithm through the use of both um, categorized images and uh, uncategorized images so semi supervised classification is actually so is actually employed to learn from both of both types of data labeled and unlabeled data so in these scenarios that i have explained um, one could could um, could take advantage of both labeled and unlabeled data and that the the idea is that um, we could improve the decision boundary for a classification from a, su a supervised a fully supervised algorithm with the unlabeled data so that the decision boundary now would have a better generalization. So in a broad sense, um, semi-supervised classification consists of lab um, learning from both labeled and labeled data. Well, labeling data may require the allocation of expensive resources like human expertise and time and all of these resources quite, can be expensive and um, sometimes unlabeled data wh which is label that is produced um, without um, a target without a desired output which is the label can be quite um, quite cheap and easy to obtain um, so in the scenario where the unlabeled data is plentiful, we can. It's the scenario where semi supervised classification really uh, excels, because with semi supervised learning algorithms, with semi supervised classification, more precisely, um, the lack of the label information has to uh, has to be compensated uh, the trade-off is that we have to have uh, a large amount of unlabeled data so that's the scenario where the semi-supervised algorithm can properly learn from unlabeled data we have to have a large amount of 
I mean, uh, yeah, ideally, we, sh we should have a large amount of unlabeled data. So, in, in problems where they are cheap and uh, easily obtained, though that those scenarios are actually uh, where semi supervised algorithms can can uh, can produce a good result may produce a good result depending on some assumptions that we will talk about later. Um, so semi supervised classification specifically consists of learning from both labeled and unlabeled data, right? In order to produce uh, learners with a better decision boundary when compared to um, fully supervised algorithms. Okay, let's move on. Um, so, how can unlabeled data affect decision boundaries? So, let's imagine that we have a data set like this. All right, imagine here that we only have the diamond shaped uh, data points. These diamond shaped data points here represent the labeled data. All right, they have they are tagged, they are data that are tagged and they are denoted by these diamond shaped points. Um, I'm gonna highlight them here. So, this is the these are the black class and these other ones are the red class okay so it, imagine that we had only these four data points in our data set okay so we would have something like um, if we if we gave this this data set with only four data points to our supervised learning algorithm, we would end up with um, a decision boundary that would be like uh, a hyperplane here, right? So, and that would be quite acceptable, right? Because it it's it divides our 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 data set um, with the largest margin uh, separator which is if we if you recall it's the ideal hyperplane for a, an SVM so this hyperplane would be totally acceptable all right however imagine that um, we had access to all of these unlabeled data the the circle and the crosses are actually unlabeled data. They are just a circle and crosses, so that facilitates the, the understanding. But imagine that these crosses and um, circle are not labeled, right? But we can see, we can easily see that um, this labeled data, this unlabeled data, forms uh, forms like a half moon shape, two half moons sh shaped. Um, structures there. So, if we had access, if, if as we can see them now, um, and uh, we imagine that we could deliver this unlabeled data to a semi-supervised learning algorithm, right? Let's let me just highlight here. These are the half moon shape here for the red class. And this one is the half moon for the black class. So that there, those half moons, those that those clouds of um, unlabeled data now can twist, can help to improve our decision, our original decision boundary by twisting a little bit this decision boundary with um, and produce a decision boundary that goes like this okay so the aim here is that the the green decision boundary produces a better 
the generalization than the magenta one. Okay, so in that case, in that scenario, the unlabeled data helped to help to improve this this decision boundary, and um, and then we have a better classifier. All right, and this is another case where we have two half moons of shape, but the the half moon on the bottom is inverted somehow. So then again, we have the the black labeled point and the red labeled point, which are these diamonds there. And um, our supervised our supervised algorithm would would do something like this would produce a decision boundary like this right imagine an SVM or something so it would the, the optimal uh, hyperplane would be the one with the largest margin like this one and um, the idea is that once again that we had if we had access to this cloud this, this number this large amount of uh, unlabeled data the algorithm could use the distribution of this unlabeled data to bend the to twist I mean to improve the decision boundary the, the supervised decision boundary and produce some th something like this right which is probably a better decision boundary which, which will be which will uh, generalize better than the original supervised decision boundary all right, and here is yet another example where we have um, two classes, and as you can see, the the supervised decision model will be something like this, and the semi-supervised decision boundary should be something like this. These two decision boundaries uh, are quite different, as you can see, because we have a really sparse black class and a really compact red class in that case. That case is, is quite different from the other ones. All right. And um, we also have this example here, and this example is multi-class. We have six classes. So now we have six, let's say six, this labeled points were chosen randomly. So we have six labeled points and six classes here, okay? Notice that in all these examples, we have very few labeled points, okay? And quite a large amount of, um, in comparison, we have quite a large amount of unlabeled data, okay? So the, the semi-supervised um, decision boundaries would be something like this. It would take into consideration the the unlabeled data there. So it would be something like this. Okay, fair enough. So how do we how do we address the unlabeled data in order to make up for the lack of the label information in so many instances we have to make quite i mean quite strong assumptions okay we have to assume that the data distribution which represents which can be represented um, in those examples there that we saw we saw earlier is represented by those for example two half moons so we have to assume that those the classes are somehow related to those two half moons, okay? Uh, in other words, we have to assume that data distribution, which is p of x, somehow helps to elucidate, helps to clarify the posterior class distribution p c of c given x, okay? Or how does that work? Um, in those examples, we have to assume that the, the shape of the, the class is somehow related to the shape of the entire, uh, of 
to the shape of the unlabeled data somehow. Okay. Imagine that um, that those um, half moons that we saw earlier does not correspond to classes. Imagine that, for example, there are three different classes in each half moon. Okay. So that would be uh, more difficult to the semi-supervised learning algorithm to take advantage of the unlabeled data. So, for example, imagine that we have here on the right bottom part here we have these unlabeled data here and there. Okay? Now imagine that we have only two data points, an X, uh, the red X here, and the green circle. Okay? Two data points. So here, it would be something like those two half moons, right? As you can imagine. Um, the, the supervised decision boundary would be something like this, okay? And um, and um, and um, well, to be consistent, let me just paint this the circle class with orange here. The, there's an orange circle there, and I'm sorry for that. The orange circle, and just to be consistent, I'm gonna paint the same supervised decision boundary with green. And the green decision boundary, if we take the 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 black dots as unlabeled data, the same supervised decision boundary would be something like this, okay? However, let me just erase these decision boundaries there and there. Now imagine that uh, the true classes, okay, the true classes are actually like this. Red, red cross, red cross, and the red cross are right there. And the orange circles are actually right here. If we had access to the labels here, all right. So the true classes are actually like this. Orange circle, orange, sorry, I'm not very, my circles are not good, I know but bear with me. So there is no, there is no guarantee that your data set cannot be like that, isn't it? So the semi-supervised algorithm would do, would, uh, would do something like this with that decision boundary, but it, it would be totally, totally wrong. All right. And, um, but the supervised decision boundary actually can get this quite better. And the magenta decision boundary is actually the correct one, isn't it? That's because the supervised learning algorithm does not depend on the data distribution. It does not make that assumption of the data distribution having something to do with the class, the posterior class distribution. So in that case, the unlabeled data will actually harm the quality of the of the, the generalization of the supervised learning algorithm. All right, because in in that sense, if 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 the data distribution is not linked, does not help to elucidate, the classes are not in the same in the same more or less distribution of the class distribution, then the supervised learning algorithm won't won't improve at all. All right, it will have a really bad can have a really bad um, decision boundary. Okay, so aside from that, we have to make yet another assumption. We have to make an assumption of how the shape of the p of x actually takes okay so i mean we have to assume how the class distribution is linked 
we have to assume it's linked we have established that and we have to assume how it's linked okay so the relationship we have to assume that relationship have a particular form and in the in the semi supervised learning literature we have three forms of this assumed relationship we have this smoothness assumption which states that if two labeled instances sorry if two instances labeled or unlabeled um, are are similar they have they should have similar classes they should have similar output for outputs for them the cluster the cluster assumption um, it states that if two instances are close to each other are similar to each other and are in a high density region of your data set they should share the same label and the manifold assumption states that if two instances are embedded in a manifold which is a low dimensional structure in your in your data these two instances should share the same label uh, just a parenthesis here this movement assumption is actually in many uh, supervised algorithm as well they, it it makes the decision boundary quite smooth all right it it doesn't allow the algorithm to change abruptly from a class to another one okay so what are the motivations of our work so semi supervised classification uh, in semi supervised classification literature the many algorithms in the literature they they implement the largest largest margin separation separator uh, where with very few labeled instances in and overlapping classes okay um, the position the problem is if you implement the large mar largest margin separator with um, with the labeled instances on borders of high density regions the position of these labeled instances in a cluster let's say a cluster a high density region the position of those label data can quite harm the can 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 harm the the quality of the decision boundary let's say you have a, a labeled instance in a gap between two clusters uh, in that gap is where the, the a good decision boundary should be but as you have a label point and the label point carries a lot of information which is the label uh, that decision that that labeled that labeled instance will twist a good decision boundary into a bad one it will it will shift the decision boundary towards the the high density region let's say so it will the position of that only because the position of that one labeled point the decision boundary can be quite um, can have a bad quality so in literature these algorithms are sensitive to the position of the the very few labeled points however some clustering algorithm for example spectral clustering can uh, can identify those um, those high density region regions which are the clusters with some degree of overlap in class and ignoring the the labeled points all right it only focus on finding the high density regions and, all right and um, this some cl some some clustering algorithm can actually uh, do better than margin based methods I mean it can find the high density regions and inform us where the gap are where the gaps are between these high density regions and is irrespectively from the label data that that would uh, twist the large margin separator decision boundary okay and another thing is 
the in literature uh, most of the of the methods are for binary classification and they would depend on decomposition techniques which are suboptimal for for application in multi-class in multi-class data sets okay then let's move on so our algorithm was designed in order to be robust to the position of the few labeled points in a cluster so how do we do that we use a clustering algorithm that delivers a soft partition to estimate labels and the density of regions okay so the cluster based regularization algorithm uses um, the structure given by uh, the clustering algorithm in order to ignore the labeled points in gaps and focus on the density of the of the that area okay so it becomes robust to the relative position of labeled points in that cluster even if that label point is in a border is in the, the borders of a cluster and um, the information of the soft partition is encapsulated in a regularization term in our objective function so when the data set possesses a cluster structure our algorithm can be robust to overlapping classes and um, misguiding labeled instances so what's the intuition behind our algorithm imagine that we have um, a, po a data point here and uh, other points there the intuition is that the dark data point here okay the dark data point um, should have a pseudo label I mean if the, the dark data point is unlabeled so the expected we assume that the expected I mean, our, the expected output for that um, dark data point is a weighted average, okay, of the output of its neighbors, okay, according to uh, penalty, okay, according to some similarity function, which is our penalty here, which is highlighted over here. So this is a penalty function. The more similar two instances are higher the higher is the penalty it's a similarity measure so if the if the decision boundary is splits somehow uh, an instance from its neighbors we penalize the algorithm quite quite severely and u here this measure u is the pseudo label which is an estimate of the 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 label for the unlabeled data right there, the dark point that I just did right here. So U is just a weighted average of the classes of the output for the neighbors of instance n. And the output of the of instance n of the neighbors of instance n can be either the the output of our classifier if k is uh, unlabeled or the true label if k is labeled so k is the neighbors are the na represent the neighbors of instance n okay then our objective function becomes like this we implement it with cross entropy this re this term represents the supervised error and this term represents the semi supervised regularization term this part here it measures how far uh, the output of the unlabeled points are from the desired from the estimate output of the unlabeled points lambda is a trade-off uh, parameter max of qn represents the density of inst of the region in which this uh, instance n it lies in Q N, max of qn actually represent actually is the highest probability for a given cluster for instance n l and u are the quantities 
L represents the quantity, the amount of label data, U the unlabeled data, and I here represents a mask telling us if the instance is labeled or unlabeled. Okay, then we update, let's say we have neural implementing our algorithms with neural networks. This we would um, we implemented our our classification algorithm with IRLS, which consists of several of these Newton Hafson um, steps. And here are the derivations for the gradient part of the Newton Hafson step and the Hessian matrix. Okay. And finally, we have some results here. Look at the decision boundary produced by our algorithm for that two half moons data set. And here is for, it's for the inverted two half moons data set. The decision boundary quite avoid the high density regions. And here as well for the, for the sparse class and for the compact class, it actually have, produces a good decision boundary there. And here for that um, multi-class data set, um, take a look at how the decision boundaries avoid the highest density regions. Here is a, an example of how robust our algorithm is for the position of the label data. You see, this label data is not influencing too much of our decision boundary right here. You see, uh, over there and over here, okay? So our algorithm is designed for multi-class classification and is robust to, to the position of the few labeled points in a cluster. And, um, and it can employ a soft cluster algorithm into semi-supervised classification in order to regularize the decision boundary produced by a supervised quantity. Uh, it is accurate in the presence of the very few labeled points and is robust to the position of the labeled instances in, that, in those clusters. Okay? And that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.